<clears throat> if you are here for uh, first time or first time in a long time, we've been considering a God's Word, and specifically this portion of God's Word, this timeless teaching that's become known as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, you're coming into, yeah, a series, and um, these aren't exactly standalone little bits. Uh, there is a progression here, and we've enjoyed watching that unfold as we've found um, the beginnings of this Sermon on the Mount are the beginnings of a kind of a, a manifesto of Jesus saying, I am a king, this is a kingdom, and this is the culture and the manner in which my subjects live and love, exist, the way things are done, the priorities that are held, this is what it is in my kingdom. And uh, we've been taught or reminded of the profound changes to our existence were made that were made at our conversion when, when the Lord brought us to himself and and the fact that these changes manifest themselves. We're talking about characteristics, traits in the lives of true Christians that are truly in the kingdom of, of God and his Christ. Characteristics that show up. We're talking about a, a walk with God that cannot, too big, too vast, too glorious, cannot be stuffed and internalized and hidden from the world around us. It can't be. That if there is the reality of, of, of Christ, his presence, his regenerative work in us, it cannot be hidden. You'd sooner jump in a pool and not get wet. So we're talking about a kingdom in which people are changed and made different. We're talking about a very, very different kind of a life. We've been seeing how his kingdom was at that time only recently inaugurated in the world. Jesus was born of a virgin and lived a sinless, spotless life. And in three years, three and a half years of ministry, he begins to lay out the truths of this kingdom. And we know that this kingdom, though new then, has continued to unfold. And one day we will see it in its full realization, its full glory, on the day of Jesus Christ, as the scripture calls it, a day of un parallel bliss and joy and glory and transformation for those who love and wait his appearing in a day the same day same Christ same return that it says the nations will mourn over and while some dance some will crumble down in mourning and tears for not having received this king and entered his kingdom in this life, for it's in this life, it's in these short years that we embrace the king, that we bow to the king, and we become subjects of his kingdom because after that day, there will be no more opportunity. So, so this does have a certain urgency to it. It's as urgent as our lives are uncertain. It's as urgent as we are unsure that we'll make it to tomorrow morning. Or next Sunday, I'll give my, my heart to Jesus next week. Or I'll let his light so shine through me at a future date when it's more convenient. There is an urgency here. And I don't want us to miss that because I know it kind of seems like, my God, this could go on forever. We've only gone through nine verses in about 12 weeks. Seems like this could just go on forever. And while the sermon series may seem that way, our lives are not guaranteed. We may not get to the 13th or 14th installment of this. But for those who have already entered the kingdom, you're not going to miss this or any other sermon once he's come. So we speak of a new higher, radically different life that is ours to live if we've trusted in Jesus for our salvation, for his lordship. <coughs> now, as we've gone through the Beatitudes, and as we just read it now, maybe this is your first time reading it, you see this list of, almost sounds repetitive, 
You wonder if he's just structured it this way for just poetic creativity. Blessed are these and blessed are those and blessed are these others. The truth of the matter is, is, as we've looked, we've seen that there's much to say about each and every one of these truths, each and every one of these blessings that he, he lays out. Um, it's not a mere list of efforts that we're to make or actions that we're to take. But it's telling us that our doing must of necessity come from our being. That is, that we are merciful because we've been shown mercy. We are poor in spirit because we've confronted his richness. We are meek because we realize the difference between him and us. We hunger and thirst for righteousness because we have met the one who is righteous and had his righteousness imputed to us who were sinners. And our doing must flow from our being. We are not preaching a, a, a play nice kind of a message. We are not saying, hey, you ought to behave in this particular way so that God will love and hopefully change you. We're saying that once God changes you, there is necessary life that must be lived. There are Necessary traits that must be shown. And the most real evidence of our having come to know him and be known by him is, is profound. The proof of our salvation is not in some fading, distant memory of some walk you took down an aisle one day. Or some hand you raised at some meeting. That memory cannot be the thing that, that, that tells you you're saved. That cannot be your showpiece piece of evidence as you make the case for your being a subject in this kingdom. That cannot be your star witness. For you're being saved. That, that, that will not keep you secure and assured in your walk. It can't be just even, even something as beautiful as your baptism. Or the first time you took part at the Lord's table. No, it's got to be something more and it's got to be something more current. It can't be just some distant and increasingly distant memory as the years go by. There has to be ongoing, initial for sure, but ongoing transformation of mind, soul, priorities. It's called what the scriptures call sanctification by the Holy Spirit working in our lives. Ongoing growth. You do well to question your heart, your salvation, your place in God. If you look today as you looked two, three, four, five years ago. If your knowledge of him, if your passion for him, if your representation of him in this world looks no different than it did all those years ago, I invite you not just to an indictment of, uh, of shame, but I invite you to maybe, maybe consider, would you, the fact that you might need to be saved and today's a good day. Because again, if and when it's real, it cannot be hidden. It cannot be put to sleep. It cannot be put in neutral for the past 10 years and say, oh, yeah, I'm saved. I'm saved. I raised my hand. No, no. The question is not did you raise your hand. The question is did he raise you from the dead? Because it shows. And, and, it, and I, know, I know I'm being kind of, kind of abrupt and kind of strong with this. But evangelical America is suffering today. And the witness of Jesus Christ in our country is suffering today because of so many people who've been told they're saved and aren't. You can't say that, Pastor. That's offensive. No. No, you know what's cruel is to say nothing. What's cruel is to leave someone thinking that, that when they were six and raised their hand at some, some drummed up camp meeting or VBS. 
that that made all the difference and they should see no more difference from that day and that that they just file that away as they do their fire insurance policy and say, on the day of judgment, I will hearken back to that day and God will have to respect it. No, there needs to be ongoing evidence of a living God living in and through us. So, to truly have God in one's heart is to experience real change. Real change that won't let you take grace as a cloak for secret sin. It won't let you cry foul or legalism every time you are prompted to right and righteous behavior. No, it's a heart that, again, hungers and thirsts for righteousness. That wants more and more of him. And isn't offended when people call you to just that. The heart that is really transferred into the kingdom of heaven from the kingdom of darkness realizes you're in a new neighborhood with a new culture, with a new king. And you would do well to expect drastic, dramatic, radical change. I don't care what your experience is. I had a friend, and she lived like hell, and she said she got religion, and she still lives like hell. So I don't, no, 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 no. Don't base it on that. Don't base your judgment of how much God can change a life on some hypocritical situation you've been unfortunate enough to witness. I'm talking about a God who changes profoundly, fundamentally changes lives. And, 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 and there's, some, there's some saved folks who are saying, I don't like where he's pushing this. And there's some lost folks saying, that's just what I'm looking for. I don't want superficial change. I have changed. I have changed clothing. I have changed social circles. I have lost weight. I have changed jobs. I have changed spouses. I've changed all kinds of things. And it doesn't bring the kind of change my heart's looking for. You're, you're in the right place today, friend. Because I'm talking about a Savior that will change you down to the depths, down to those places, those itches you can't reach, those sins that you can't paper over. This is the kind of change we're talking about. And this, this, this transferring into this kingdom. Now, now again, we've, we've, we've stated it before. I've, I've just been pondering this. And, and I, don't, I don't think we, we do this enough justice or give God enough glory. Every one of us is an immigrant into this kingdom of heaven. And we come from a dark, distant, different, radically, uh, completely, diametrically opposite place. And when we're brought in, it's a radical Radical change. I remember watching my kids be born. And I remember as they came out and they take their first breath. I'm happy. Marlene's relieved. But I'm watching my babies, all three of them, go through a certain amount of trauma. Gravity, I'm not used to gravity. I used to float in perfect, perfect balance. Now all of a sudden there's temperature and air to deal with. I used to be in a perfectly hermetically sealed, temperature controlled, just ideal situation. They come in, they have to gasp air, expand lungs, open eyes, light, noise. It's different. It's totally different. Don't tell me you can cruise into Christianity and have no change at all. Because the new birth is even more drastic than our carnal, fleshly birth. And if you find so much of your life, your your, your priorities, your way of seeing and saying things, if you find that they still resemble so much the other kingdom that you came from, I put it to you today, you may not have ever left. Transformation that Paul spoke of in Colossians 1 is, is this drastic. You don't have to turn there. We're starting in verse 9. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge. Listen to this. These, these, these are things that they're being filled with, things that they did not have prior to this. 
the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Listen, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Does that sound like change? Am I overstating my case here? Radical change. All things that we had no idea of prior to coming to Jesus. Paul says, my prayer for you, Colossians, is that you would embrace that which is yours now, and what you have now is radically different. What you have now is not in addition to what you had then. It utterly replaces all that you had then. Knowledge, wisdom, power, joy, faith, all these things that should be just exuding from us. And he says, and I have every reason to expect God to answer my prayer and do all of these things in your life, not just some of them. Why? Because you have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, if you're not averse to writing in your Bible, I would invite you to, in verse 13 of Colossians 1, that you circle that little word, and. Because he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. He saves to the uttermost. It says that he delivered us from the domain of darkness. Can somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Some have been saved so long, been nice so long, been, been so, so living so well for so long, you almost forgot. But no, you, you, you were, I was, we were all brought from a very, very dark place. And I'm so glad that he didn't just deliver us from, but it says that he, he transferred us. He delivered us from the domain of darkness and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Oh, what, 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 a, what a, a blessing it is to be taken out of the pain that was our yesterday. But to be taken out of it and be left somewhere in between is much like the, the covenant people of Israel being brought out of Egypt with the intention of a promised land, but between the, the, the slavery of Egypt and the milk and honey of the promised land, it says they wandered in a desert for 40 years. Not where they used to be, but not where they should be either. Wandering, walking in circles, dealing with scorpions and snakes and, and, and surrounding tribes and bickering and moaning about the menu. You're not even supposed to be there. How do you complain about a place you're not supposed to be? It's like walking outside today at 3 o'clock, standing in the middle of the street and having the audacity to say, it's hot. You're not supposed to be standing in the middle of the street at three. And to come out of darkness, refuse to enter into light, and then complain about the desert. It's where so many of us find ourselves. All the while, with fish stuck on the back of our cars, calling ourselves Christians. The kindness, the gentleness, the meekness, the hunger, the thirst, the humility that comes with Knowing him is just far, far from us. This is drastic. He did both. He took us out and he transferred us into his kingdom. That sounds like real drastic change. I know I'm dedicating about half of the time here to the intro. Just to rehab. Just to not let us think, oh, all right, what's the next beatitude? No, no, no. I'm scared to go on to another one if we haven't dealt with the past ones. I'm scared for us to, to, to see these as a, a list of to-dos rather than a celebration of our being. 
to who we are now in Christ Jesus if, in fact, we are in Christ Jesus. So continuing in the words of our Lord Jesus, we come to verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And there's an amazing wealth in every one of his utterances. And there's times where you hear people talk and you say, you know, that was a little windy. You could have said that in much fewer words. And then you hear Jesus talk and you say, in those few words we could preach for the next 10 years and still not do it justice. It's no different when we get here to verse 9. When we look and we truly give ear and heart to the word of God, we see that volumes are spoken in every syllable. As you've seen over the last few weeks, you see here today, it may seem very simple. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the sons of God. It sounds, well, it kind of makes sense, right? Sounds like a very Christian thing for Christ to say. I mean, yeah, that yeah, makes sense. He is saying be nice, right? That's just an old-fashioned way of saying be nice. God likes when we're nice. I'm sure he likes when we're nice, but he's saying much more than that. I mean, of course Jesus approves of people who, who make nice with others, right? Right? Well, the answer is yes. But the answer is yes to a degree that a superficial, moralistic reading of this cannot even approach. The answer is, yes, God is okay with the idea of making nice, but to a depth, to a height, to a breadth that maybe we yet to ponder. This idea of blessedness, as we said, this, this idea of God's approval. When God says, blessed are these and blessed are these, what he's saying is, approved are these, commended are these. So these people get the applause of heaven, the smile of God, because they are living, they are being what he made them as he transferred them into the kingdom. And when he speaks of this particular idea of peacemaking, I mean, it, it stands to reason that as our God, this great peacemaker, would approve of this, for he is the great peacemaker through Jesus Christ, as we'll see here in a moment, and that his children would be called the sons of God, in relation to this stands to reason. If, if we're like the great peacemaking God, then we would be called the sons of God. This, this phrase, sons of God, even in, in Jesus' time, was um, it's not the same. Some of you, depending on the translation you have, um, and because of political correctness and a creeping feminism, um, will change it to say children of God. Let's remove every reference to masculinity and let's make it all gender neutral. Well, the, the phrase is sons of God. And that's important here and everywhere else it is rightly translated because the reference to sons of God in their time, speaking to a, the Jewish crowd, makes reference to bearing the image of when you spoke of something being the son of something or someone being the son of someone else, you're speaking of that son being an extension of that father, a representation, an image bearer of that father in a certain capacity. So carrying on, carrying a strong resemblance to the father. Certain commentators have said being a chip off the old block. And he says that when my children are peacemakers, they can be called the sons of the great peacemaking God. They bear that image. They carry that strong family resemblance. They're like that God. Born again as sons of God by the faith in Christ Jesus, we bear the image of that great peacemaker. Not perfection, a resemblance. Not perfection yet. But increasingly bearing, bearing that family resemblance, looking more and more like our father, the king. And Jesus declares a particular blessedness, an identification with, as the sons of God, 
for a group of people that he calls peacemakers. Now, when I say he calls them peacemakers, uh, I say that uh, with a little bit of qualification. Um, even the term peacemaker, as you read it there in your Bible, and we hear it a lot. We hear people talk about I, I heard some um, things on C-SPAN, if I'm not mistaken, uh, recently, and, and two um, legislators were back and forth bantering, and one of them chose to use this phrase calling for some kind of a negotiated ceasefire, and they said that someone ought to be a peacemaker. And, 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 and that word is in common usage today because we find it in our Bible. We, hear, we see the word peacemaker in the Bible. But, but know this, that, that even the fact that peacemaker is in the Bible is, is an interesting thing because it wasn't there. Back, back in, the, in, in the, early, or, or the early part of the 14th century, as William Tyndale is, is, is working on his English translations of the Scripture, a, as he looks at the Greek, there's a compound word in Greek that's made of two really deep and profound individual uh, Greek words. He says, the English of our day is, is insufficient. He had to make up a word. That word peacemaker didn't exist until Tyndale put it in the Bible. And now it's come into common usage, and, but it's now actually all too common of a usage. But if you're a peacemaker, you're a pacifist. You're a, somebody who just doesn't care enough to deal with the issues. You could be called a peacemaker. You could be an extortioner. You could be someone who threatens someone into, into just burying an issue by use of leverage or threat. And, and if the end result is that there's not a loud conflict, you too could be called a peacemaker. It's just thrown about, and it's not at all what Jesus had in mind when he was speaking on that mountaintop. We would do well to rightly define what God means when he talks about peace. What Jesus meant is that word exited his mouth. Jesus always was aware that from the moment that his kingdom came, there was an effort by Satan to create a counterfeit kingdom. Something close enough, something near to it, not so loudly and blatantly opposed that we could totally tell them apart easily at first glance, but I mean, a good lie is only a good lie if it has a little bit of truth in it, right? And so he creates something that would look something like whatever God was doing, but never approaching the, the greater reality. And so he did with even the idea of peace. And that's why Jesus, really already living in the shadow of the cross, in John chapter 14, turns to his disciples and he says those famous words to them, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus knew the world would offer up something like peace that's not peace. And he, he immediately creates a, a differentiation there. He, 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 he sets them in stark Contrast. He says, listen, I give you peace. Peace I leave with you. I mean, it's a beautiful statement when you think of who it comes from. The prince of peace. I mean, the very heralding of his birth, of his birth was peace on earth and toward men goodwill. This, this is Jesus, the prince of peace. And when the prince of peace says, I give you peace, Oh, that's wonderful, but it comes with a teaching on the tail end. He says, peace I give you, and then he qualifies it a little further when he says, my peace I give to you. So that means there is a quote-unquote peace that is not my peace. Making a distinction here because there are going to be a lot of things that you will call peace, that you will turn to for peace, that will be offered you as peace that aren't peace at all. The world offers up all kinds of counterfeits. And I, we could go on forever just talking about it. But you already know. And moments of lucidity and honesty with yourself. When the lights are out, no one's looking and there's no one to impress. We know when we look back at those things that we have clung to. 
for a sense of peace that we know that they have come miserably short. That we've tried to find peace in our hearts with things that just won't even weather the hard days of life. They certainly won't stand on that great day before the king. Things that we've turned to and, and for a moment we hung our hopes of peace on them. You remember at any given time where maybe you had a little, a little stash of money for a moment? Oh, now we don't have to worry. I'll sleep better. It brings me peace to know that I was able to put together a couple grand in the bank. And, oh, I just, I just feel better. And money, as the prophet says, has a way of making wings for itself, does it not? And with it goes our peace. And we hang our hopes for peace on power and influence. Now I'm in control. Now I'm in control of the situation. Now they call me mister at work. Now, now I'm going to take charge of this relationship. Now I'm going to, and, 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 and ultimately we find out that even we are not to be trusted with our own peace. We've tried to find peace in our own health. Oh, good. The doctor said it's not cancer. Not today it's not. Peace is kind of short-lived, isn't it? Peace needs to come from somewhere else and rest in somewhere deeper. It needs to be something more real than that. We've tried to find peace in human relationships. Now I got a man. Yeah? Yeah, you've had to haul that broken piece into offices just like mine. Oh, no, see, now all oh, this girl, she's the one. tried to well-known temporary fixes for pieces of chemicals for sex. And we know that within a couple of hours, not only is the piece gone, but it's replaced by a larger pain. And in the ears of Jesus' audience on that hillside that day when he, he speaks this to them, Again, it, it was like a thunderclap in their ears. He's speaking peace. As Jews, I mean, we don't go a day without talking about peace. We greet each other speaking of peace, shalom. I mean, and, and, and the idea of peace was everything and all encompassing to them. The idea to, to a Jewish crowd and, and coming from a, a Jewish rabbi, the idea of, of, of shalom goes far more... Uh, Deeply goes, 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 it has a much larger, longer, deeper reach than when we talk about peace. We speak of peace with very, very low expectations. And the peace that they had come to pray for and sing about, they knew it came only from God. And they knew that it was much more than what we call peace today. See, we tend to think of peace as just a, an absence of conflict. I was looking online the other day at some of the more famous headlines in, in history that, 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 that covered uh, newspapers, I mean, above the crease, top, big, bold letters, and, and at the end of World War II was the Japanese signs, the headlines on some of the major newspapers read, Peace, and I thought, well, maybe the bombs aren't falling anymore in the 40s and a lot of our servicemen get to come home. But really, can you authoritatively declare peace? I mean, this kind of peace, this shalom. See, this shalom that the Jews talked about, it wasn't just the absence of conflict. It just doesn't mean... I'm not at war. When, when, when the term shalom and the concept of shalom is dealt with in the Old Testament and continually into the New, because Jesus is fulfilling the New, the Old Testament in the New. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That, that Old Testament shalom is what he is speaking of, is what he's bringing, it's who he is. And so when he speaks of this shalom, he is speaking of not just the absence of conflict. He's speaking of the presence of wholeness. 
a peace that, that, that encompasses and envelops and permeates all that we are, a deep, abiding, untouchable, unwavering, uncircumstantial kind of a wholeness that is there and stays there because it comes from God so that so that if we said let's call back all of our troops out of all of our theaters of operation around the world and we bring them in and we say there we don't have one more troop out there we don't have one more loaded gun out there could we really declare shalom Let's say we eradicated domestic crime and there was no more violence between us. Even then, could we really claim peace as God declared it? But this is the peace that is given. In the midst of all the chaos and all the conflict and all the war, Jesus is still talking about peace. Jesus says to them, my peace I give to you, and you couldn't throw a rock without hitting a Roman centurion. Peace? It's a peace that has nothing to do with circumstance. It's a peace that is found in his kingdom only. He says, this peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do you hear him? He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of a divine gift. It's not just saying, hey, I'm cool with everybody. I don't have any ongoing fights. I have peace right now. I invite you to a, a real, lasting peace. So, peace then, in that context, it's so much more than just, I'm not at war, I'm not in conflict. This is the peace he's talking about. So it can't be a peace at all costs kind of attitude. Taking a path of, I had somebody tell me one time I was just married. Someone, matter of fact, whose marriage is a, an utter disaster. Pulled me aside and in a very sage tone of voice told me, Eric, you know, in marriage, the best way to handle things is always take the path of least resistance. Just give in, man. It's not worth it. And I remember I was everywhere from wanting to bust out laughing hysterically to being enraged at the audacity. And I remember what came to my mind is, no, you know what? I love my God and my wife too much. So I always take the easy way out, man. Because what you get with that attitude is not peace. You might quiet the argument for a moment. You might negotiate a temporary ceasefire. But shalom, you have not. And when Jesus tells the people on that hill that his approval and his smile and his blessing is on those that are peacemakers, he's not talking about those who will paper over or just, or just ignore issues or just candy coat issues or play like they're not there, stick their head in the sand and say there's not a problem. It's not peace at all costs, particularly as it pertains to his kingdom. It's not saying that for the sake of quieting conflict that we are to allow for, wink at, turn a blind eye towards sin. It's not peace at all costs because that's not peace at all. Forsaking what is right and eternal for immediate temporary pause and conflict. You know how parents do. I don't want to push and she's got a mouth on her. Just let her do what she wants. At least we're not fighting. You don't have peace. 
And he said, blessed are the peacemakers. Sometimes in order to make peace, you've got to stand for what's right. It's not saying, just for the sake of, of the doors to stop slamming and the shouts to stop in our house, we're just going to let sin run amok. You don't have that option in this kingdom. It's not peace at all costs. Because remember, the citizens in this kingdom, they hunger and they thirst for yeah, righteousness, not just quiet. They seek what's right. Husbands, insist on it. Take nothing less. Remember that the, the, the subjects in this kingdom, they are pure in heart. Why would they wink at sin? Accepting, ignoring, condoning. These aren't options. That's why James in chapter 3, he writes, he writes, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. There's an order there. Because for the sake of peace, you cannot throw out purity. Some of you have not made a decision for Christ. You are wrestling with his call on your life because what will the family say? And you think you have created peace by, by postponing, by rejecting, by resisting as best you can the call of God. Because I don't want there to be problems in the family. What you have created is not peace, friend. And I hope that in the final calculation of things, you think it's worth your condemnation. To keep your aunt from talking too much or your grandma from getting mad or your homeboys from thinking less of you. If you're willing to sacrifice eternity, you've not created peace. Far from it. Matthew 10 Jesus says some peculiar things sometimes that we're, we still wrestle with. Matthew 10, verse 34. The same Jesus who sits up on a hillside and says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Says in Matthew 10, just five chapters later, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's the easy one. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So what's he saying? Did he come to bring peace? Yes. Did he not come to bring peace? Exactly right. It's not a contradiction. There's no, there's no opposition in these two statements. One is looking at it from his perfect point of view and one is considering it at ground level. One says, yes, blessed are the peacemakers. I am the prince of peace. My peace I give to you. And on the other hand, he says, my peace, my peace is so different to your definition of peace that my definition of peace will divide. The reality of the peace that I give, that I offer, that I die to bring you, it will of necessity cause division. Folks will look at you differently. You can already see when you read ahead what we're going into next week. Why would he go from blessed are the peacemakers to blessed are you when people revile you and treat you poorly? Why? Because in the process of making peace, you will be hated. Ooh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know about that, pastor. I just wanted to sign up in church and get some religion. This is Christ. We don't enjoy it. We don't prefer it. It's the reaction of folks who don't have peace to the peace that God offers. And he says this so that 
we would not be tempted to sugarcoat the gospel, to water down or candy coat the truths of this kingdom so that no one would be offended, no one would be bothered, there would be no problems in families or in neighborhoods or at the workplace. No, he says, expect this, know this, this is what peace does. This is, this is the effect of peace. Nonetheless, our peace remains, even in the midst of people rejecting the gospel and us who carry the gospel. Our, our peace is enduring. It's an abiding peace. But we're not just speaking of peace. We're speaking of peacemakers. And we're not speaking of peace creators. Our peace comes from God. We are purveyors of that which we've received, just like we are merciful because we receive mercy. Just like we are meek because he said, follow me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. We give what we've received. We make peace by being purveyors of the peace that he's already given to us. So We're not speaking of either peace likers, peace wanters, peace dreamers. No, he, his blessings upon those who are peacemakers. There is action involved. There are steps to take. There is courage necessary to be a peacemaker. Sometimes the people that we most tout as, as, as peacemakers in the world are the people who don't stand up for anything, or the people who don't, don't stand up and, and say what's right and what's wrong. They just roll over and take it. We say, that person, that, that's a peacemaker. The fact of the matter is, that passivity, that lack of action, automatically disqualifies one from being a peacemaker. You've heard the expression that you've got to break some eggs to make a cake? Making peace takes some work, too. And it takes saying some truth. It takes some sweaty, nervous conversations. It takes some twitchy, blushing Talks where things are said that under normal civil circumstances you don't say, but out of love for God and peace and the person you're talking to, you say what needs to be said for the sake of the true peace that God offers. Peacemakers shall be called the sons of God. And yeah, it speaks of the things we speak that we that we think of when we think of peacemakers. Yeah, it speaks of those brokering peace in interpersonal conflict, being able to respond rightly when when there's offense or conflict between you and another. And the Bible gives much much instruction regarding that. Proverbs fifteen: a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. There are words we should use. A word fitly spoken is like an apple of gold and a setting of silver. We, our words should be seasoned with salt. We should speak the truth in love. All these things, yes, these are true. These, these are true, and we ought to be peacemaking people. We ought to be people who know how to make things right. I mean, it was taught to me when I was young in the ministry. A, a wise pastor said to me, every member in your church carries two buckets, young man. They carry a bucket of water and they carry a bucket of gasoline. And at any moment in the church, there are flickering sparks of conflict going on. And every member has a choice to make. Which bucket will they throw? And a peacemaker will always choose to put it out. And to tell someone where sin has occurred and lead them to repentance when that covers a multitude of sins. We ought to do well in that. I, I think that almost goes without saying, although there are some who insist on conflict. Who, in fact, need to protect their citizenship. But remember that blessed are the meek. Remember we said how meekness was that ability to not stand up for your own cause, but stand boldly for the cause of Christ and what is right. To not feel the need to defend yourself, your name, your image in the eyes of others, but stand boldly and at any cost for the sake of his renown. And that 
that goes a long way in handling interpersonal issues, huh? When dealing with defense and hostilities toward us or, or even brokering peace between two other people. Going and sitting. Being that wise, impartial, godly arbiter, mediator between the two and you, you help them arrive not just at who wins and who loses, but at how can we best glorify God in this. Peacemaking is work. It's the work of asking someone to forgive you if you have offended them. It's the work of reaching down deep and forgiving someone as you have been forgiven. It's work, is it not? But it's not just that interpersonal stuff. It goes deeper as we'll see. Paul wrote to the Romans and he says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Believe it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's a curious saying, huh? Treat your enemies so well that it freaks them out. It's the Eric version. Respond to hatred with love, and it will of necessity, beg the question, why? And that's your opportunity to say, him. I treat you like garbage. Why are you so kind to me? Because I treated him worse and he saved my soul. So Paul's instruction is wise and realistic. If possible, if possible, so far as it depends on you, Live peaceably. Honestly, do the maximum possible for a peaceable coexistence with others. But why does he qualify it so much? Because even despite our best efforts, there will be those who insist on conflict. And at that point, the argument is not with what you're doing, what you're saying, but who you're being. They resent the peace that is in you, the Christ that you follow. But again, Paul invites us to honest introspection. As much as is possible. That means do all that is possible. Not this, well, I tried. Call, they didn't answer. That's nothing like what he's talking about. I passed by them, they didn't say hi. I'm not mad, I'm not mad, I'm just, just not talking to them. Go up, repent. Come to the kingdom, honor the king. It takes work. Blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah, I can see why God would smile. After maximum effort, know that there's going to be those kind of responses, and we're going to do all that we can to remain honestly blameless before God's eyes. And having done all that we can, there will still be sometimes conflict. For Jesus offended none, and they hated him. But before you compare yourself with Jesus, make sure that you've done all you are. Putting yourself out there, yes, for even further abuse, for even further mistreatment, for even a rejection. Why? They rejected him. And from the very cross they hung him on, he cried, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But you know, it goes further than just being able to handle conflict between yourself and others, or broker peace between two folks in conflict. Conflict. I'm talking about a deeper and a bigger peace. A peace that is, yeah, it has various facets to it. Real quickly. The peace that Jesus is talking about Primarily, fundamentally, the peace that will lead to all peace in all these other areas, it does have to deal with the absence of enmity. But not just between the ab- not just the absence of enmity between you and another person, but most importantly, the absence of enmity between you and the Holy God. Romans five. Paul celebrates with the Roman church. Therefore, 
since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I know, I know. No, 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 think. He wouldn't celebrate peace unless it at one time wasn't there. He celebrates peace because that peace hasn't always been there. And he knew the believers would get this, that he could say to a group of Christians, listen, we, and he knew that they would take that to mean we sinners, have peace with God, and they would take that to mean God, the holy and righteous one. We have peace with him. That's a wonder. That hasn't always been there. That, does, that deserves far more than a yawn and a Christian ho-hum. But your eternity depends on that peace being right there. And he says, being justified. How? How did we come to this peace with him? We were justified. How? By faith. Faith. And even that faith was a gift from him. That he gives you the grace to believe in him. The grace to repent. It all comes from him. He gives us peace. Let me tell you something. I remember being in school. There was times I let my, my mouth slide out on the basketball court and just get a little bit too far. And there was guys who didn't know how to turn it off when the game was over. And I remember one guy said, this ain't over. I said, yeah, it is. We won. He says, no, you were, you were talking the whole time. I said, I thought we played the game. And he says, not with me, you don't. And see, this is all a lot of schoolyard talk, except for the fact that he had about 40 pounds and 6 inches on me. And at any given moment, you're going to have people who don't like you for various reasons. But there are certain people that you really don't want to not like you. And none of them compares to he who is the righteous and eternal judge of all men. You do not want enmity with him. And so when he speaks of peace between you and him, this is a wonder. And before you say, no problem, I got no beef with God. I want you to know what Paul also said just eight verses later, after he celebrates the fact that we have peace, he says, this is why it's a big deal. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his son. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. He says we were enemies. Who's this we? Anybody within earshot. How can you say we to a big old Roman congregation and include everybody in that we? Because there is not one human, no, not one that is righteous, none that seeks after God. All have come short of the glory of God. All were constituted enemies of God. You can't say I have no beef with him. By virtue of our sin, our sinful nature, our reprobate, completely depraved humanity that we were born with, we came from the factory enemies of God. And that through Jesus Christ, he offers peace. Man, I'll tell you, that day in high school, I would have taken anything. I would have taken anything to get that guy off my back. I would have been a fool. Somebody had told me he likes Snickers bars to not buy him a Snickers bar. What a small, horrible illustration of what we're talking about here today. Here is God at war with man, offering peace. But again, the peace he offers is not some negotiated ceasefire. It's not some armistice. It's not some let's sit down and, and talk about the truth. It, 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 it's, it's far more a surrender than it is a negotiation. 
I mean, really, even, even, even with this guy in high school, I didn't have a lot of negotiating space. All right, look, this is what we'll do. We'll do what he says. peace he offers is through surrender. But beyond the, the absence of enmity, there is the presence of this relationship with the king. This is we were given, when we were given God's righteousness and shown his mercy, we wanted more of his righteousness and we displayed his mercy. 2 Corinthians 5, just listen to this. Therefore, if any was, anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen. We love that verse. Amen. Keep reading. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us. You don't need to reconcile unless there's a problem, right? Reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You are not just given mercy. You are called to be merciful. You are not just reconciled to God. You are given a ministry of reconciliation. He goes on. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You are not just reconciled to God, but in charged with, entrusted with a ministry. What's my ministry? Reconcile people to God. In one hand, take vile sinners just as we were. And in the other hand, a righteous, saving God and bring them together through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our ministry. For those who are waiting, waiting for God to just reveal himself. He just did. There's your ministry. That's what you're called to. That's why he saved you. What greater act, and I leave you with this, what greater act of peacemaking is there than to reconcile a sinner with a savior? Than to take someone who is hellbound and introduce him to the king of glory who through his son and faith in his son offers Gracious salvation, adoption, preservation, glorification, eternal bliss at his right hand. And this is the news we preach. This is the message we carry. That is the peace we make. He's not just saying be nice. He's not saying play nice with one another. He's saying bring sinners to the true peace of Christ. As you were brought. And that's always been his plan. 700 years earlier, Isaiah wrote, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation. He says to Zion, your God reigns. He's speaking of a kingdom, a reigning God, but he's speaking of a message. Peacemakers have always been blessed. Isaiah says that God looks at them and says, your feet are beautiful to me. For your feet carry this message wherever you go. How beautiful are the feet of those who carry this message of peace. How blessed are the peacemakers. Are we so blessed? Is that us? Is this our ministry? Do we know this peace? Do we dispense this peace? Are we the sons of God? Do we bear that family resemblance? We serve a God who reaches for sinners, no matter how hostile they are towards him. Do we bear a resemblance to that? Reaching for sinners, no matter how hostile they might be toward us, with the end in mind of an eternal lasting shalom that they can have in him. Is that you? Is that me? can be, it must be. 
Friend, I pray this for you today. You might be 13. You might be 63. You might be at the end of your rope. You might be at rock bottom. You might be at the top of the heap. But you don't have peace if you don't have Jesus. And that would be sad news. If the gospel message didn't continue to say, come to me, all you who are burdened, tired, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your soul. Would you come to Jesus today? How long will you try counterfeit peace? How long will you will you continue to hang your hopes on things that have failed? The approval of others, momentary bits of happiness that go into your mouth as honey but turn to gravel in your stomach. Today, through this message, I pray that peace would be made. And again, it's not a negotiation, it's a surrender. You come to Him in faith and repentance, and you receive the peace that only He gives. And in so doing, you're born again into a new kingdom with a new king and a new culture. And a new end to the story. And a new glory that awaits. We've been reconciled, church. And we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. Knowing this, can you go in good conscience? Can you go this week without telling Various people about Jesus. I mean, really, if this is our life calling, can we go a week outside of it? A month? Because our fear oftentimes is that we're going to damage some kind of a fragile peace that we have at the workplace, in the family, in the neighborhood. What you have is not peace. What they have is not peace if they don't have Jesus. And how dare you in your peace, in your salvation, sit back. And deny the ministry of reconciliation given to all of us. No, but that we in joy might celebrate like Paul. The peace that is given to us. The peace that we share. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And we have enough to